Lil Nas X brings 666 Satan-themed Nike Air Maxes to the market, and Nike sues for trademark infringement. Can Lil Nas X's lawyers ensure his salvation? Well, that might depend on what you mean by salvation. Today on Stuff You Should Know About IP, we cover the trademark battle from hell, literally. Today's episode of Stuff You Should Know About IP is brought to you by the Trademark Lawyer Magazine. If you want to stay up to date with everything that's going on in the world of IP and trademarks, go to www.trademarklawyermagazine.com. Each issue is free to read for up to eight weeks. That's trademarklawyermagazine.com for global news in the world of trademarks. All right, Tom, what in the hell is going on with Lil Nas X? Oh my God, I love how you put that. What in the hell is going on? So it's funny because about two and a half or maybe two hours ago, I had never heard of Little Nas X, okay? <laughs> and then you and got I a very heard, interesting call from me. Yes, and I had never heard of the Satan Shoe, which I should have. It's almost like I've been living under a rock now that I've been doing a little bit of reading on it. But so basically, just to kind of frame this with a little background, in March of this year, a company called Mischief, and by the way, it's spelled funny. It's M-S-C-H-F, mm. Mischief. So if you want to search it online, it's M-S-C-H-F. They collaborated with a recording artist whose name is Montero Lamar Hill, also known as Lil Nas X. And they collaborated to buy a bunch of Nike Air Max 97 shoes, modify them, and then sell them for a ton of money. And when I say a ton of money, these shoes sold out in a minute. In one minute after launch, one minute they sold 665 shoes for $1,018 each, That's insane. okay? That's insane. So, and the reason I emphasize 665 is because they held back the 666 shoe. As you know from Revelation, that is the sign of the beast, right? Uh -huh. And that uh, Lil Nas or uh, Montero Lamar Hill was going to, I guess, give away to someone he wanted or sell it or do something really cool with yeah. the 666 the number 666 shoe, because each shoe they consider a work of art. So each one is numbered just like a print of a painting would be, like the first print, the 50th right. print, the 666th print. So, so uh, Mischief and uh, Lil Nas get together to create this. But just to kind of round this out a little bit more before we get into the Satan shoe, a year before, in, well, actually two years ago, in 2019, Mischief came out with another shoe, which is called the Jesus shoe. So the Jesus shoe, that. yeah, so the Jesus shoe was white, you know, all white. And the, the Satan shoe is all black with like red. And the Jesus shoe was all white. And essentially, they, the, the, the shtick on that shoe was, first of all, they only had a couple dozen of those, but they sold them for up to $3,000 per pair, okay? Wow. And they make these things works of art. Like in the Jesus shoe, they got um, they got holy water from the Jordan River, and they shot it into the soles. So you get the soles, and you see liquid in there. It's holy water. And like they have crosses thrown into the laces, and they make it look like a Jesus shoe. In fact, there was a quote, which I forgot to write down, but it was something like, what would Jesus wear? You know those bracelets that are, what would Jesus do? Well, they had, what would oh, Jesus man. wear? And it was like the dopest sneakers of all. And it was like the, the Jesus shoe. So that's in 2019. And Nike doesn't care. They're okay because they're getting a ton of great press on the Jesus shoe. Flash forward to Little Nas and Mischief creating the Satan shoe. And the Satan shoe looks like Satan would wear it. Like what would Jesus wear and what would Satan wear? And it's got, so they, in the sole of the shoe, they put red dye. So when you lift it like this, the red dye is flowing in the sole of the shoe. Uh -huh. And their stick on this is, like in the case of the Jesus shoe, they got holy water from the Jordan River. The Jordan River, I'm pretty sure, is where John the Baptist was baptized, right? Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, in this, they take a drop of human blood, actual human blood, 
that was like donated from all the mischief team. And they put a drop of human blood in every shoe, in the sole of every shoe. So it's red dye to look like blood, but there's actually real blood in there. I feel like, I feel like I just pause on that. Human yeah. blood? Yeah, yeah, I like, know. It's, it's, listen, you got to give the them. the CDC have a problem with that? Yeah, right. <laughs> like, you got to give them props for being creative, right? So I, not only that, but they have like this Pentagon-shaped pendant on the top of the shoe, and it's got like some text on it. They've got a citation to a, a phrase in the Catholic Bible from Luke 8, 10, 18, which is, I saw Satan fall like, or fall like lightning from heaven, okay? So the shoe actually says Luke 10, colon 18 on it. And, and then the box, like the box that the shoe comes in, which is, you know how Apple always has really cool boxes to their phones? Oh, yeah, yeah. This has a really cool box. I mean... It's almost like Renaissance art inside. When you open the box, there's like a whole hell scene with, you know, all these people suffering in hell. And so it's it, like, I've, I've been to the Louvre and you see like wall, like Renaissance painting after Renaissance painting. And there's all these like hellish scenes. That's what the box looks like. And then it has the Luke 10, 18 actual quote on the box, right? In the okay. inside, so you open it up and there's just bam, this really intense artwork. And um, so so they released the Satan shoe and it coincided with the release of a new Lil Nas song entitled Call Me By Your Name and a music video, which is all about like Satan as a snake coming down the tree and then he's attacking Lil Nas and then all kinds of nasty stuff happens. But it's a little tiny bit unsettling the music video. Very intense. You know, the graphics are very intense. So, so the, um, so they have this out there and the problem though, unlike when the Jesus shoe came out, which by the way, the most Googled shoe in 2019, the Jesus shoe. So Nike gets all this great press because, you know, everyone's not a Catholic. There's all kinds of religions, but usually people don't get this uncomfortable feeling when they think of Jesus, like whatever your religion is. You're like, you're not getting all this negativity around Jesus, for the most part. Some people might, but for the most part, whereas Satan, there's a lot of like frightening negativity that goes with it, right? Sure. Yeah. So, I, I so with the with Jesus that. shoe, yeah. So, and, and look, I'm not against your Satan worshiper. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, I'm not bashing you. I'm just saying, even you would have to admit if you're a Satan worshiper, it's kind of frightening, you know? So, just a little bit, yeah. Yeah, so the, so the Jesus shoe creates all this press, the number one Google shoe in 2019, Nike pays this much money for all that press, right? right? Because the way mischief works is they buy the shoes at retail price, tweak them such that they're not even Nikes anymore, although they still have the swoosh, and, um, and then they resell them. So Nike has nothing to do with this. It's not, they had right. nothing to do with the Jesus shoe, they have nothing to do with the um, Satan shoe, right? Right. So it's got nothing to do with that. So they spend this much money on advertising and they get all kinds of visibility around the Jesus shoe, right? right. Then comes the Satan shoe. Right. Now they're getting just as much press, but it's not the kind of press they want. They're getting negative comments on social media. They're getting threats. They're getting people boycotting them, right? Yeah. Because, right. because it looks like they're sponsoring the shoe. Right. Now, it's kind of interesting, Ray. In 2019, when the Jesus shoe came out, it probably looked like they were sponsoring that shoe too, right? Yeah. But they didn't care because it was working for them. You know what I mean? Right. It's working right. in their favor. But as soon as it's working against you, you got to protect your brand, right? Yeah. I mean- their brand is worth a fortune. I mean, their brand is worth probably as much as their company. I mean, they're the Nike swoosh, right? Yeah. It's a, it's a famous mark. And I, they have I got to protect. wear Nike shoes. Yeah, they got to protect their brand, they're, right? They're great. You know, you yeah. associate good shoe, Nike. Exactly. Exactly. When you see the Nike swoosh, you feel like, wow, that's quality, right? And that's yeah. what a trademark is all about. You know, being able to build your quality brand, and then that becomes a sales rep for you. Exactly. If you see anyone with a Nike shoe, you know they got a good shoe, right? Yeah. So, so what do they do when they're getting all this bad press suddenly? They immediately bring a lawsuit against mischief. 
in the New York State District Court. They have original jurisdiction in the New York State Federal District Court because they're suing under the U.S. Lanham Act, which is the trademark act, essentially, for the for federal court. And But they do something else because they are worried because this is becoming a runaway problem, right? They're getting threats of boycotts. They're getting negative press. They're getting associated with devil worshipers, and they don't want to be associated with that, right? It's tarnishing their brand, okay? Right. That's yeah. an important phrase. It's tarnishing their brand. So what do they do? They sue for trademark infringement under the cause of action of a likelihood of confusion. Yeah. They also sue under something called dilution, dilution of their brand. Now, trademark infringement under likelihood of confusion is essentially people think it's your product when it's not. And the reason they think that is because something that looks very much like your trademark is on it, right? Yeah. The trademark identifies the source or origin of the product. So when you see the Nike swoosh, who do you think of? Nike. Nike, of course. And that's what they want you to think right. until it's on the Satan shoe, right? <laughs> so the problem and, that they have now is- Going forward, I'm going to think, now every time I think of Nike, I'm going to think of the Satan shoe. Like, how can you- Erase how that can you get that memory. out of your head? The damage yeah. is done. Yeah. So here's the here's the weird situation they're in, though. Okay, let's say that Mischief was a company that was selling tens of thousands. They were in the business of selling the Satan shoe, right. and they were going to be selling it for years, maybe decades. Right? Nike sues them. They bring what's called a temporary they, a motion for a temporary restraining order which basically is saying to the court, we want you, before we even get into the lawsuit, we want, I mean, before we get deeply into the lawsuit, we want you to temporarily restrain mischief from selling these shoes. Because every day, every minute that they're out there in the marketplace, they're hurting our brand irreparably. Like you just said, Ray, I love the way you put that. It's in your head already, right? Yeah. When you think of Nike, you're going to think of the Satan shoe. When you see the Satan shoe, you're thinking of Nike, right? Right. So that's what they're trying to prevent. So there's various phases. You could go for a temporary restraining order, a preliminary injunction, something to stop them. And they do a TRO, which is very urgent and very fast, right? Within days, you're in court for a TRO. Right. So Because this all here, played so, out just in the last, like, week and a half yeah it's all just played out I think, right I mean, I even though they announced it or they went on sale on palm sunday which is yeah. like the start of you know the christian holy week right right and even though i just learned about it today it's been in the marketplace for several days you know what it kind of reminds That's me a of short you, period of time for all this to play out right yeah 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 exactly very short that's what a tro is all about they're trying to stop it quickly before it destroys their brand anymore irreparably like they can't get they can't fix it you know what i mean right so it's funny because mischief responds and says essentially it's moot because we only made 666 pair we've already so we sold 665 pair in one minute we've already shipped over 600 of them so what exactly are you restraining us from doing we're not selling anymore right it's a yeah, weird position that that nike's in because they, so they, what they demand is destroy all the shoes, right? Wow. But they're already out there, right? right? If the they're already who has it, paid for it, and has it. Like they can't recall it, right? Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna do a mandatory recall that's not a safety recall. Like it's and even for safety recalls, how do you recall all? You get a car with bad brakes, you send out a recall notice, but people come in if they want. They don't come in if they don't want to, right? Right. So you're not going to get someone who just paid. In fact. The fact that you paid $1,000 for a pair of shoes that is now all over the news, they're demanding a recall. You think anyone's going to return it? Oh, they're probably worth way, way more. more. Right exactly, now exactly. And they went on sale. So it's a weird place that Nike's in and Mischief is in. It's almost like bringing the TRO, bringing the lawsuit. I mean, they could sue for damages, but a temporary restraining order is just the first part of litigation. You're, you're suing that you're suing an action. It's going to progress the way it progresses. But before it progresses, they want to get them to get the court to stop them immediately because it's so irreparably damaging. So it puts them in this really weird place of 
the deed, the damage is done and there's no more sales and you can't get them back. Right. So what do they do? They prevent the, the, the sale of the 666 six, six, six version, which, by the way, Ray, I guarantee you will be worth a fortune. Right. I mean, who yeah. who who in the crowd of people that are buying these again, they're probably buying. They're not where they're probably not wearing them, although we're going to get to that. They're probably buying them as art for their house. Like they'll go up on a shelf. But you're going to have the 666 version. And if it's not unsettling to you, like you don't feel like you're bringing the devil into your house or something, um, that would be a really valuable piece of art for you, right? Sure. Especially with all the press. But here's the funny thing that I was thinking about. There's so much press now that pretty much everyone, well, not everyone, I had not even heard of it until today, but a lot of people probably no longer associate it with Nike because all the message has been, like I went to YouTube and watched a couple of people who do this thing called unboxing. Do you know what that is? Uh, yeah. It's actually surprisingly it's, cool. It's but like weirdly entertaining, right? It's weirdly entertaining. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, I thought this has got to be the stupidest thing. And then all yeah. of a sudden I found myself, I couldn't look away. Yeah. You know, the, the height really... of Western civilization is watching <laughs> videos of people of boxes of their product that but, <laughs> look i thought it was going to be really stupid but i couldn't wait to see what was in the box you know right and anyway they're unboxing this thing and every and the, the guy saying on youtube is like this has nothing to do with nike you know just so you know this is not a nike thing and people i think are pretty much hearing that it's not about nike but it's still really spreading a message so yeah. It's probably jacking up the price of these things. So whoever bought them is probably going to resell them for twice as much now if yeah. they want. It's jacking up mischief and their reputation because everyone's hearing about mischief now, right? Like yeah. I said, I never heard of them before. And now I even know how to spell their name, which has got that funky smell spelling. And even Nike, in a way, is probably getting, it's going to turn to good branding because they're fighting so hard against this, this like, uh, Right. Tarnishment. Right. But by the way, I want to just mention the other cause of action is dilution. So there's trademark infringement, which is a likelihood of confusion. People yep. buy a product and they think it's a Nike product. But Nike's position is you've changed it so much. It's not a Nike product anymore. Right. But still, people think it is. They're confused in the marketplace as to thinking it is. Right. But the other cause of action is dilution. And that means even if people are not tricked, they, they know it's not a Nike product, right? Right. But it's in your head, right, Ray? It's in your head. Yeah. It's in my head. And if you are a famous and mark, in order, yeah, in order to have the anti-dilution or the dilution cause of action, it's got to be a famous mark. Because famous marks are so famous that I think the mentality is it doesn't really matter whether people are confused or not. Your brand will be tarnished depending upon what that brand is associated with, right? You know, like a lot of times, like they'll brand something, you might have like a sex uh, website that's called like whatever, Microsoft. And people are going to be like, oh, you know, that's got to be Microsoft. Or even if it's not, I'm thinking of Microsoft when I think of that. And I don't like that. So right. anyway, so they're bringing an action for dilution as well under the, under the U.S. Uh, federal law. And that doesn't even require people to be confused. So they have a, they seem to have a good case, but, you know, mischief's response as well is that not only did we uh, all, do we already sell them all, but they're also saying, hey, um, you know, no one's even using these as shoes. They're, it's just art. So no one, and oh, they say the, the buyers are so sophisticated. They're, they call them sophisticated sneakerheads. And they're so sophisticated and it's so expensive that everyone who buys it knows it's a mischief product, right? right? Right. They're buying it from us. They know it's not Nike. But again, for dilution, you don't need likelihood of confusion. Right. But then Nike still comes back because one of their cause of actions is likelihood of confusion. And they say, well, you say no one's wearing them. We just saw an Instagram post from Miley Cyrus, who has 127 million followers, where she's wearing them. Right? right. So you say their artwork, but Miley's wearing them. Right. And she's spreading the fact that she's wearing them to 127 million people, which is a lot of people since our entire country only has 350 million people. Right. Right. Now, now I'm, I'm sure, sure Miley has... only put them on to take that one photo. 
Oh, She's not yeah, wearing yeah. them to the gro- in her trip to the grocery. <laughs> oh yeah, but you know what? She might be because she's rich enough to wear I guess, a, you're right. a twelve hundred dollar pair of shoes. Probably her cheapest pair of shoes. Yeah, they're her kick around shoes. Like when yeah. she's going out to do gardening, she's wearing them, right? So, but anyway, so I agree that these they're probably a bunch of sneak sophisticated sneakerheads that are buying these things as art. I mean, it seems like yeah. I don't know, it seems like an art piece. When you see it, Ray, because you're gonna probably have to get the images to put up on the, the podcast, yeah. you're gonna see it looks like a piece of art it looks like a piece of renaissance art you know right again during the time when a lot of stuff for yeah with yeah exactly and they succeeded because it looks really cool there's no question that if you're the kind of person who likes that sort of thing it would look cool on your um on your mantle you know it's kind of like a i don't know some people put like professional football some people put trophies some people who knows what you're going to put stuff (laughs) so yeah you go to your satan room it's like you got your jesus room you got your satan room this is cool for your satan room but anyway so the the other thing that that mischief says is um you know you didn't hate you weren't hating on jesus shoes you weren't complaining about those right that's that's what i'm wondering well but so here's the thing and then they use the word censorship they say, like, now you're censoring our speech, right? Because we're trying to think. And, and by the way, there was a thing about this. I read one article that said something about their claim that, um, I, wait, I want to think of the way they put it, was they're making an artistic statement that Nike will partner with anybody. You know, essentially, they're like whores or something. You know, they, they don't care who they work with or what the principle is. They'll partner with anybody. And that was kind of like their message. And I thought to myself, Okay, if you're talking about copyright law, that's different. You might have an exception to copyright infringement because you're using it to voice your your opinion about something that's newsworthy or something that's artistic, right? Right. And and that that could be an exception with respect to copyright law. But this is not copyright law. This is trademark law. And you are allowed to censor with respect to your trademark. In fact, that's the whole point. That's what, yeah, that's what that, why the law exists. Yeah, you have to ca- cautiously, carefully guard your brand image, right? Like if you buy a franchise to whatever, Yogan Fruits or something, Yogan Fruits will make very certain, I don't know if you've heard of that, but no, it's like that. a, I, you know, an old friend of mine had a Yogan Fruits franchise, but, and he asked me, he came to me and he said, why are they making me buy their sugar and all their products? They're just trying to rip me off. And I said, well, maybe, but they're also trying to protect their brand because every single Yogan Fruz thing has to taste the same, the same quality, because they're trying to make it so that when you see Yogan Fruz, you think, wow, I know that because I had it somewhere else and it tasted really good. Like go into the Hilton, go into the Marriott, same experience wherever you go, right? Right. So you are allowed to censor your brand. That's the point of it. It's not like, you know, the government censoring you or the news media even, although the news media can censor, but this is a brand. By definition, you need to censor. You need to police your brand to make sure that it is a consistent message, consistent quality with respect to your brand. Otherwise, your brand becomes meaningless. You know, that's why there is a dilution, anti-dilution law in place. That's why there is a trademark infringement under likelihood of confusion in place so that you have the ability to police your brand, to make sure that that quality in people's head stays there and doesn't get destroyed by somebody producing a cheaper product or something that breaks. You know, the other day I bought a product. I'm not going to say, I'm not going to say who made it, but it was a rototiller. And the, the pull thing immediately isn't working after like 20 minutes. And is, I'm like, this is thing is terrible. I think What's that? Rototiller is a brand. Isn't it? Oh, okay. If it's a brand, I'm not saying the brand. I'm just saying the tool that does rototilling, right? Or whatever that is. That, um, I don't know. That might be a dilute? brand. It oh, might oh. Beca- Is wouldn't it a brand? Like, wouldn't that? I don't know. I we'll have to look that up. But it would be an interesting example of um, generic. Gen- gen- yeah, becoming yeah, a, gener- a trademark becoming generic. Okay. Generic, yeah. Let me but, just emphasize. Yeah, if I, there I, is still a brand. No, no, no. If there's still a brand called Rototiller, I'm not saying they have bad products because it was not the Rototiller brand. Right. I'm un, I, I guess you're right. I should think before I talk about this. Maybe <laughs> I am genericizing it, which is not cool. But anyway, the device, put it this way, the device that digs into the ground, right? I can tell you're searching it, right, Ray? Yeah, I don't think it is. I think okay. rototiller is the tool that it's called. But anyway, 
I pulled the thing <laughs> and it wouldn't go back in. So I couldn't start it again. The and I'm thinking, and I looked at the brand and I'm like, yeah. I don't want this brand again. So imagine if somebody's making a product with your brand that you have spent a fortune mm -hmm. making sure you have the best parts, the best design, and they have cheap parts and they, and people like me look at it and say, oh, this is terrible. I don't want to buy that brand anymore. Like I would never buy the brand of this product again because of my first experience with it. Now, what if it wasn't even theirs? That would be tragic, right? Right, yeah. So, that, that so that's what Nike's all about here is we got to protect our brand. So anyway, that's where we are today. They got their TRO, but I don't know to what effect it is for them because the products are already out there. Right. They can't destroy the products and they're not selling anymore, except they did block them from selling the 666, the number 666 the version, yeah. or, you know, the, six, the, final the final one. But in blocking them, again, I think the price is going to go through the roof. Right. Everyone in that ilk wants that 666 version now. Like, right. if you think they wanted it before because it was 666, now they really want it. Right. You know? Yeah. But, uh, you know, divine intervention is preventing them from yeah, you know, like that's right. reaching 666. <laughs> yeah, if you I, call I Nike keep... divine, you're calling Nike divine, which is nice. You're complimenting Nike because they're a great brand, Yeah, right? sure, yeah. We'll, we'll, yeah you guys what you're you doing. have it, Nike. Go ahead. <laughs> um, no, so I have two questions. One, uh, let's start with the first one. One is, how strong is that argument that they didn't have a problem before with the Jesus shoe? But now they have a problem this time. I mean, in, is, okay, it even front, gonna, even, is it even going to work for them? Yeah. In front of a judge, this is how much impact it would have. Huh. In front of a jury, who knows? Who the hell knows? Right. right? So, right. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so so I got my word hell in there, right? Why so, doesn't it matter, though? Can well, here's why. Out? Because you have the right to police your brand, Right. And if, and if the message associated with the Jesus shoe was something you're okay with, that's your prerogative. You own your brand. It's not like you have given up all right to police your brand because you didn't do it once. It's a totally different message, you yeah, know? That so that's the point is you are allowed to censor your brand, right? right. Yeah. So right. what was your second question? Second question is, um, can Nike, is there any recourse for damages that have been done as a result of the dilution argument because i like in my situation now i i've i've researched this and i know what's going on but and i'm a nike customer right so yeah. i'm going to say you know let's just say hypothetically my position is i don't want to buy from any companies who are promoting satanic yeah stuff, so if right you, yeah if you're so, someone who doesn't like that sort right. of thing now right. i know so i'll buy nike again in this hypothetical situation. But what about all the people who didn't figure out that Nike wasn't involved and are perhaps still boycotting them? I mean, they've certainly lost money as a result of this. How much, I don't know, but it's gonna hurt them in some way. So how yeah. do they? How would a court deal with that? And what, what ability does Nike have to recover damages for whatever has been done? Yeah, so there is a guy named Gabriel Whaley. I think it's W-H-A-L-E-Y, Gabriel Whaley. I saw an interview of him. He's the founder of Mischief. I think he's the founder. And he seems like a young guy. I mean, if he's, I don't know, 30, I, that'd be my guess. And apparently Mischief is getting pretty big and pretty su successful. But are they big enough and successful enough to absorb the damage award that, that could go against them if this litigation goes to its ultimate conclusion. And I mean, I don't know, Nike's big, you know, I, I guess their, their stock price went down. I just looked at an article that said it went down by 0.4, right? 0.4%. Well, they, are, they have a pretty big market cap, I'm sure, right? Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that their stock market as, you know, the, the, the price of the stock market has anything to do with their damages. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying maybe if sales are down, I don't know, maybe they've lost sales. But let's say they have, and Nike's such a big, you know, giant company, a little tiny shift could be tens of millions of dollars that they could lose. Right. And mischief could be on the hook for that because they're the ones who are arguably diluting the brand. Now, if, if, if the, so let's say that this thing goes to verdict, right? It's not settled. A couple of years of litigation go on, it goes to verdict. 
Mischief spends, I don't know, half a million dollars, a million dollars defending themselves against Nike, maybe more. I mean, when you're dealing with a big giant company like Nike, they've got big law firms and they're hammering papers, right? And arguments, so it could get expensive very quickly. Um, so that they would lose. Then they lose the, the, the case, right? Now they got to pay damages. That could be, I don't know, 5 million, 10 million, tens of millions. I don't know, but that could break a company, you know? Right. Way more so, than they made on the shoes. Yeah, because even legal. if they sold them for $1,018 per shoe, they only sold 665 of them, right? right? They couldn't, that 666 one better make a lot of money on the black market to cover their, um, cover their costs, <laughs> you know? Right. But let's say they sold 665 at a thousand per, they're still not going to be, they're not going to be winning that. Right. Right. That's not, it. you know, that's just not enough. So, and that's the gross revenue. I was looking at the cost. I was just kind of imagining how much it was to cost to modify these shoes. And then the packaging, the packaging was really nice, you know, and then they probably spent a lot of money making, you know, getting these shoes ready for sale. So, but the point is, yes, Nike, is potentially damaged. And if they are, they can collect. Now, again, I'm not concluding that they're going to win this case because I'm sure there's a lot of sophisticated legal arguments that I haven't considered in my hour and 47 minutes of hearing about Lil Nas, Nas and, and reading everything I could about it before our podcast. But I don't know. I mean, it seems like if they, had, they have a pretty good case and if they did, but it'll probably settle. Like ultimately, uh, mischief will come out with an apology or something and they'll do a bunch of social media stuff and everyone will somehow win in the end. You know, like mischief is super popular now, right? Way more than before. Right. Nike weirdly is getting a lot of, they're getting boycotted at the moment, but you know, people don't have a long memory for this kind of stuff, but they'll still remember Nike. So um, I don't know. It'll probably settle. Interesting. Well, I think this is probably one of the more fascinating trademark uh, infringement cases that we've taken a look at. Me um, too. And uh, if you guys enjoyed listening to this podcast about the Satan shoe and Lil Nas X and Mischief and Nike, uh, please share your uh, your comments below. I, I, I'm hoping for some interesting ones on this one in particular. Um, and of course, share the podcast with your friends and, and colleagues. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>